This episode of Max Scoville's Study Hall is brought to you by Gamefly. Hello there! Welcome to Study Hall! My name is Max. People call me the pop culture prof. This world is filled by media called popular culture. For some people, pop culture is a hobby. Others use it to get in fights on the internet. Myself? I study pop culture as a profession. Now first, are you a girl or a boy? No, seriously, I can't tell anymore. You kids all have Miley Skrillex haircuts and skinny pants. It's very confusing. Hello, and welcome back to another episode of Study Hall. If you're unfamiliar, this is a show where I take a video game and then discuss a whole bunch of related media that I think would appeal to fans of that particular game, as well as discussing that game's place in the pop culture ecosystem. This episode says Pokemon in the title, but you'll have to excuse me if I get a little bit tangential, or tangeligential, if you will, because there's obviously a lot to talk about. And hey, who knows, maybe I'll do another episode about Pokemon if you guys enjoy this one. Without further ado, let's get into it. If you're between the ages of 15 and 25, there's a good chance that Pokemon is something rooted firmly in your early childhood. For me, it showed up during those painfully awkward years between childhood and adolescence, and I think I was drawn to the universe for its innocence and simplicity during what was otherwise a really upsetting time in my life. Since then, Pokemon has had a pretty interesting cultural life cycle. I watched it go from being the coolest thing on the playground to the dorkiest thing you could get caught with in high school, and then in college, when the statute of limitations on its dorkiness was apparently up, it became perfect fodder for semi-ironic Halloween costumes. And now, in 2013, everything's come full circle, and I know a whole bunch of grown-ass adult people who are actually interested in Pokemon X and Y. Though, to be fair, I do hang out with a bunch of nerds. So aside from nostalgia and its innocence, what's so great about Pokemon? What makes it work? And what makes it stick around? Some people go for the collecting, feeling like they're actually obligated to catch them all, while others are more drawn to the competitive side of it, memorizing stats and animal types and all that stuff. Personally, I've always been really fond of seeing all the different types of Pokemon. With Pokemon X and Y, the roster is going to be over 700 different monsters, and that's quite a lot. I know some people say the designs have gotten a bit desperate. We've gotten Pokemon based on everything from the alphabet to piles of garbage, and some of the new ones in X and Y are basically just normal animals, but with beards and leaves attached to them, but I still think they're fun. Now, what's really fascinating to me is the amount of information that people will memorize about Pokemon compared to how much information they'll actually get about real-world animals. And don't say real-world animals are boring, because that's a load of crap. For instance, did you guys hear about the Olinguito? This little guy made some headlines online a few weeks back after it was announced that a new species of mammal had been discovered in South America, which is a little bit confusing since it makes it sound like somebody was walking along and this funny animal jumped out of the tall grass and they said, oh, I guess we'll call that an Olinguito. But in reality, the discovery took place in a museum where scientists had been examining some skulls and pelts of this animal called an Olingo and noticed that some of them were smaller and denser than others. And after a bunch of research, it was determined that what we've been calling the Olingo for so long is actually broken into two species, one of them being the Olinguito. And we've been mislabeling it as the Olingo for years. Okay, so maybe this falls into the same category of anticlimactic scientific discoveries as, hey, Pluto isn't a planet anymore, and the brontosaurus never existed. Some dude just put the wrong skull on an apatosaurus skeleton and made up a new name for it, but I'm still glad to have learned about the Olinguido. After all, they're saying it's the smallest member of the raccoon family. Plus, it's fun to say, Olinguido. Some of you guys are probably banging your little fists on your keyboard, livid that this video says Pokemon, and I'm talking about real, actual animals that don't have any special attacks. Well, you know what? Some of them do. Take the thorny devil, or thorny dragon for instance. It's a little lizard that lives in the Australian desert, and when it gets frightened, it squirts blood out of its eyes. Slayer! Or hey, what about the axolotl, which looks a whole lot like a mudkip, which has a crazy healing factor that lets it regrow skin, muscle, and even bones in a matter of months, which isn't quite Weapon X status, but it's still pretty cool. Then there's this cockroach that glows in the dark and sort of looks like a Jawa. I guess that's a special ability, kind of. Some real-life animals are great and fun to learn about, but some of them are absolute nightmare fuel, like the tongue-eating louse, which attaches itself to fish tongues and then sucks all the blood out of them, causing them to atrophy, and then it latches onto the stump of the tongue fish's tongue muscles, and it basically becomes a replacement tongue. And apparently, it doesn't actually harm the fish that much, but it's just terrifying. Or hey, how about the bobbit worm? It's a vicious 10-foot-long worm that lives underneath the ocean floor in Indonesia, where it hangs out with its five antennae probing around, waiting for prey to come along. And when it does, the worm lunges out like, like one of those spring snakes, and it's got these scissor-like pinchers that come out so fast it often splits its prey in half. And if that didn't work, it, the damn thing is venomous too, so it'll just grab a lionfish and just kind of pull it down and digest it over a few weeks. Gross. 
So on that note, I can actually understand why people would want to focus on Pokemon instead of disgusting real-life animals like the Nightmare Hellsnake and disgusting aquatic mouth bug. So let's change the subject. The guys at Game Freak have said that in spite of how much people want a console version, the main Pokemon games will be staying portable, which makes sense since they're supposed to be pocket monsters. But it seems like a waste of such an interesting world to keep them confined to such a tiny screen, especially considering the larger scale of some of the Pokemon. If a big, gorgeous HD Pokemon game on a console sounds like something you might enjoy, and you happen to be a PS3 owner, then I highly recommend picking up Nino Kuni Wrath of the White Witch. This is the joint effort between Level 5, the guys behind Dragon Quest 8 and 9, and the Professor Layton series, and Studio Ghibli, the amazing anime studio behind movies like Princess Mononoke and Spirited Away. In the game, you take control of a party of young adventurers who capture familiars and make them fight each other and stuff. These familiars are basically Pokemon. They evolve, they learn new abilities, they carry items, they eat cakes, and their names are full of terrible wordplay, so you should enjoy it. Another game of level fives that caught my eye is Yokai Watch, which revolves around a fifth grade boy who gets his hands on a mysterious watch that lets him see numerous ghosts in the world around him, and in typical JRPG fashion, he winds up befriending some of the ghosts and then battling other ghosts using the help of those ghosts. So it's sort of like The Sixth Sense meets Pokemon though it sounds like there's a bit more to it than that. There's actually already a sequel in the works in Japan, but there's still no word on a Western release of the first game. I don't know about you guys, but I think it looks awesome. In Western culture, monsters are typically presented as menacing evil creatures, something to be scared of. That's not really the case everywhere else. The term yokai can be translated as ghost or spirit, but it really refers to a wide range of supernatural beings from throughout Japanese mythology and folklore. And there's a ton of that in Pokemon. For instance, Golduck bears a resemblance to the water spirits called Kappa, and Vulpix and Ninetales are based on Kitsune, the legendary many-tailed fox spirit. And the Pokemon family of Seedot, Nuzleaf, and Shiftry are all based on the Tengu, which is a pointy-nosed flying dog demon god who shows up all over the place. He's a boss in Okami, and Tengu Man is one of the robot masters in Mega Man, and those little tweeter guys in Super Mario Bros. 2 seem to be a bit Tengu-esque. Basically what I'm getting at here is that you should read up on some ancient folklore because it'll give you some perspective on Pokemon and plenty of other games. Did you know that back in the Middle Ages there was something of a Pokemon craze? Yeah, that's right. The hot thing to have was a bestiarium vocabulum, or a bestiary, which is essentially an illuminated manuscript Pokedex filled with pictures and descriptions of animals. Some real, some invented, all of them hilariously inaccurate. For example, here's a little tidbit about the antelope. The antelope is so wild that hunters cannot catch it. Except in one instance. When the antelope is thirsty, it goes to the Euphrates River to drink. But as it plays in the thickets of heresine trees there, its horns get caught in the branches and it cannot free itself. The hunter, hearing its cries, comes and kills it. Its horns are like saws and with them it can cut down trees. I don't think antelopes really do that. Tell me that doesn't sound like a crazy medieval Pokedex entry. Anyway, if you want to learn more about medieval monsters, check out The Book of Beasts, which is a translation of a 12th century Latin bestiary by T.H. White, who's better known for his King Arthur books, including The Once and Future King. Man, you guys probably thought I was going to goof off and make some bad photoshops and tell you to watch My Neighbor Totoro and call it a day. Boy, were you wrong! Oh my god, Gamefly gave me a shiny ponyta! Yeah! I better return the favor. Guys, do you know that Gamefly is the world's largest online video game rental service? They've got a library of over 8,000 games, new and old, over a wide variety of consoles, as well as handhelds. I'm guessing you guys all have the main Pokemon games, but what about the weird spin-offs? Maybe you're curious and you want to try out Pokemon Conquest, the turn-based strategy Pokemon and Nobunaga's Ambition crossover. Or what about Pokemon Mystery Dungeon, Gates to Infinity? That sounds trippy. Well, Gamefly has those and more, and when you become a member, you can rent them for as long as you like. Plans start at just $15.95 a month, and you can get up to four games at a time with no late fees, due dates, or shipping charges. And if you like the game that you're playing, you can just go and click Keep It on the Gamefly website, and it's yours at a discounted price, and Gamefly will even send you the case and manuals. For a free trial membership, you can head to Gamefly.com slash studyhall and sign up today. It is a great way to support the show and my resplendent menagerie of sparkly Pokemon. So I'm sure a lot of you can't hear me right now because you're watching another video about Pokemon that's actually about Pokemon, but for those of you who stuck around, I have just a few quick recommendations you might find amusing. The first are these gorgeous, realistic Pokemon by RJ Palmer, aka Grimchild on Tumblr, who is a professional illustrator and concept artist by day and god-tier Pokemon fan artist by night. He's done enough of these beauties to fill up a book, which you can buy online, and if nothing else, you should go look through his portfolio because it is neato. Second, have you seen the Teenage Pokemon web series by my dear friend Mr. Jonathan Holmes of Destructoid? Well, it's an animated series about Pokemon in their secondary stages, arguably their uglier and more awkward forms. 
and the various trials and tribulations that come with being an angry teenage Pokemon. This show could have easily been nostalgia-fueled YouTube clickbait, but Holmes instead made it a rather scathing satire of the angry gamer teens of YouTube, which of course pissed off those very same angry gamer teens. Anyway, that's all for today. As always, let's discuss today's lecture in the comments. What are your favorite Pokemon memories? What's some other stuff that Pokefans should go look at? Why do you even think they bothered making two other starter Pokemon for X and Y when Chespin is obviously the only worthwhile choice? Oh, there's the bell. I'll be back here next week to discuss the PlayStation and its legacy as a game system. Before you call me a sellout Sony fanboy, the week after I'm doing an Xbox episode, so chill out. Until then, may all your Magikarps become Gyarados. Ponyta, away!